Hello and welcome to Gemma Network Open Live. I'm Seth Truger, Digital Media Editor at Gemma Network Open. Of course, if you're following along live, please send us your questions or comments on Twitter at Gemma Network Open or on Facebook or YouTube Live in the comment box. Today, we are talking about the clinical effects of balanced crystalloids versus saline in adults with diabetic ketoacidosis, a subgroup analysis of cluster randomized clinical trials. And we've got two of the authors, Dr. Jonathan Casey and Joanna Stollings. Welcome. Thanks for having us. Great. Really glad you could join. This is a really interesting study. Um, so first, as usual, if you two could just introduce yourselves, tell me a little bit about yourselves and what you did here in the study. Well, I'll start. I'm uh, Jonathan Casey. I'm a pulmonary and critical care doctor at Vanderbilt University, and I um, do clinical trials like this one in comparative effectiveness of usual care interventions. My name is Joanna Stallings. I'm the uh, clinical pharmacist in the medical ICU here at Vanderbilt, um, and I uh, uh, work with the pragmatic critical care uh, trial group and help them with trials like this. Great. Well, this is really interesting. I think this is a bit of a um... You know, it's a subgroup analysis of, uh, of these two uh, RCTs um, in a line of research into the very popular or well-discussed uh, studies on balanced versus um, balanced crystalloids versus saline that I think have gotten a lot of discussion the last couple of years. Um, and this subgroup analysis is interesting. So tell us what you did here, John. Yeah, so I think understanding this, this subgroup analysis, this secondary analysis, really requires an understanding of the larger parent trial. So just to quickly describe what we did so that there was uh, an ongoing controversy and and, uh, many, and still controversial about the effects of balanced crystalloid and saline among uh, critically ill patients. So uh, in our ICU prior to this trial, we were saline adherents. So we were people who used really predominantly saline uh, prior to this trial and knew that others really believed that balanced crystalloids uh, had better outcomes, particularly in regards to renal function. And um, to investigate that, we did this SMART trial, which is this cluster randomized trial amongst, uh, amongst all of our ICUs at Vanderbilt and our ED. Uh, and patients who were in the ED and admitted to an ICU were included in the SMART trial, and patients who were in the ED and then admitted to a floor, uh, floor unit were then included in the, in the sister trial, the uh, SALT ED trial. So I think understanding how we actually deliver the intervention is really important. So I'm going to turn it over to Joanna, and she can describe how, how that was accomplished. So uh, every month we would switch between the two groups. So uh, if it was the saline month, we would primarily load saline into our automated dispensing cabinet um, in the various different units. And uh, if it was a balanced fluid month, then we would primarily load either lactated ringers or plasma light into the respective units as well. And then um, with regards to um, the computer system, uh, we had a homegrown computer system at the time called Star Panel. And it was interesting because uh, providers honestly didn't even know the trial was going on. On unless they tried to order a different fluid. So um, normal saline, they really didn't have an option to opt out. But if it was a balanced fluid month, if you had someone that had a hyperkalemia or if a, a patient had a, a head injury or if the um, attending physician for whatever reason did not want that, they could opt out. Okay, interesting. And, you know, as an ED doc where I feel like uh... – a lot of the logistics really make a big difference. I like the way that you made it so easy to kind of give the study medications or the, the, the study fluids. I feel like from my point of view, you know, as we we're starting to see a lot of the, the initial data uh, um, or even before we had data when it was really more theory on balanced, uh, balanced fluids versus saline, um, it seemed to me like if I have to wait 20 minutes to get fluid versus just the nurse grabbing it from, you know, from the, the, um, the cabinet, it's, it's, that's probably washing out any differences. So logistically, I think this is just really impressive. So really proud of what you did there. Thank um, you. And then sure. <laughs> running through some basic numbers. So you had uh, about 170 adults with DKA total, about 94, 94 in the balance group, 78 in the saline group. Um, and you showed uh, a couple different outcomes. So tell me about your outcomes here and what you found. So yeah, again, this is a secondary analysis of the larger trial. And the way that we define the cohort is that um, we looked among the 29,149 patients who were in the two trials and looked for anyone who was coded as having DKA. And then also uh, combine that, that clinical diagnosis with uh, laboratory criteria to define this population of people who had DKA on presentation to the ED. Um, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Joanna and, and say about how we, how we analyze the two outcomes. 
Um, so the two big outcomes that we looked at were um, how um, quickly that patients came off the insulin drip, and then the other one was just resolution of DKA. So we looked at, uh, obviously, like their bicarb becoming normal, their glucose also um, resolving, and then also other pH normalizing as well. Okay, and are you... Um... Oh, sorry. One of the things I noticed uh, that most most of the patients in the study, about eight, it was 83 percent had type one diabetes. Is that um, most of what you see with DKA in your population? So certainly it's the majority. I think, you know, it's only been recently that people have recognized that there's overlap and that DKA can occur with type two diabetes. You know, this wasn't the primary purpose for which we designed the trial. So I think it was interesting to get an overview. This is essentially everyone who experienced DKA in our hospital during this period of time. So I, I, I too was a little surprised by how many of those patients who met the clinical and laboratory criteria had an underlying diagnosis of type two. But when you delve further into the, uh, the data on DKA, that's, that's actually consistent with what's been published in the past. Interesting, because I would say anecdotally from what I see, I feel like I see many more patients with type two diabetes than DKA, just because there's so much more type two diabetes probably than anything else. Um, but just interesting to see how much type one there was. Um, but unfortunately, it looked like a lot of the major cause was uh, lack of um, home medications or misdoses of home insulin, which unfortunately makes sense, especially with what we've seen with kind of the, um, the insulin environment recently and how expensive it's gotten for a lot of patients. I think that's really unfortunate and definitely yeah, um, something that we see every day is that our number one reason for DKA is um, non-compliance with their insulin for sure. Mm -hmm. And then looking across your tables, um, you know, I was... One thing that was nice is the randomization seemed pretty successful. The groups were pretty comparable as far as uh, as far as uh, how severe they were, types of comorbidities and things like that. Um, it looks like interestingly, despite uh, the isotonic patients do uh, or the balanced fluids patients um, getting better faster, they they got less fluid. Do you think was it be it was because they were getting fluid um, or less quickly and just got better faster, or just that the saline patients because they were they had a few more hours of uh, DK, they were just getting more saline. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think we can speculate, although I'm not sure we have a definitive answer. Um, and I think that the amount of fluid that they got was actually statistically similar between the groups. Uh, but generally, uh, the way DK is managed at our hospital is that the fluid drips are continued until the patient's taken off the insulin drip. And because the balanced crystalline group resolved more quickly, it might make sense that the, they would have a little less fluid overall. Which makes sense. And then, um, as far as the other uh, the other difference in the groups, it looks like the um, the balanced fluid group uh, had a little bit less hypokalemia, but otherwise the other complications are pretty comparable. Um, was there anything else that that came through or came across as far as differences with the treatments that you noticed? I mean, I think the major thing to take home, and maybe I'm just thinking about this because um, I'm working in the COVID ICU too right now, honestly, is just four hours less on an insulin drip. I mean, that's a huge outcome. I mean, at Vanderbilt, um, sometimes now we are sending some patients to the floor, um, or to step down, I should say, on insulin drip. So primarily, we treat these patients in the ICU. And four hours um, in the ICU is is golden right now, not just for us, but for everybody, as we're also short on ICU beds. So I think that's, when I think about the biggest outcome from this, I think that's the most clinically meaningful one to, to me. Yep. I think it's a really important point. Um, again, I think for any individual patient, it may not make a big difference as far as four hours for resolution, but, you know, every six patients, that's a full day in an ICU, and ICU days matter a lot, both to, you know, to those patients and to all the other patients who are waiting for those ICU beds. So really key point, I think. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, John, anything else you like from the results or anything else you found interesting? Yeah, so I think that, that as you point out, for any, any given patient, this is a small difference, but it's going to add up over a large number of patients. And I think uh, you know, one concern might be that these, pa these patients often come in with hyperkalemia that's uh, related to, the, to their underlying acidosis. And I think it was reassuring to see those potassium trends that if you look at the graphs, at least uh, visually, it appears that the, that the, the average potassium dropped more quickly. Um, so it actually didn't cause more hyperkalemia. And at least early on, those patients who were hyperkalemic had, had a faster drop in potassium and it didn't hit as low. So you had seemed to have less hyperkalemia and less hypokalemia. And that's likely because of the, the, the more rapid correction of the acidosis, which is really the driver of hyperkalemia in these patients and not a total body uh, potassium excess. Absolutely. Yeah. Looking at figure one, um, there's all the different electrolyte concentration differences and the um, creatinine differences and glucose, of course. Uh, and really what struck me here is how similar they were. So even with all the resolution um, being faster by 
four hours, which was, you know, it's 13 or 17 hours of decay and 10 versus 13 and a half hours of insulin drip. Um, everything else being about the same is pretty impressive. So that's good. You guys have a tech control in your unit. <laughs> nice work. Uh, great. Uh, so I guess the, the big takeaway I have, uh, the big question I have is, you know, now that these studies are done, are, have you switched to LR for most patients in your unit? Absolutely. We primarily use L um, LR or plasma light, honestly, um, are the two uh, big uh, fluids that we use. It's uh, rare these days to see a normal saline order, and definitely if we do, there's um, some education uh, provided uh, if we see that. But um, we don't see it a lot, which makes me one happy camper. It is interesting. I mean, it's not that many years ago that, uh, like John said, we primarily use saline. So it's uh, this has definitely changed our practice completely. I'll, I'll put one other um uh, piece out there, which is that it, it's it, these are the kinds of studies that really take large numbers of patients to figure out that there are things that that four hour difference is something that you'd be unlikely to notice if you were managing DKA patients yourself. Um, so this trial was conducted among this large group of patients, 29,000 patients, every patient in the, in the hospital. And um, at the end of the trial, we found that there was this lower risk of make 30, the low risk of uh, new end-stage renal disease, persistent uh, renal dysfunction, or death. Uh, and uh, you might think, well, at the end of the trial, had the providers noted that, would their practice patterns have changed? So in our ICU, we were predominantly a saline ICU. I mainly used saline. After being forced to use balanced crystalloid every other month for this period of time, by the end of the trial, had I figured out that my patients did better, better with balanced crystalloid? And, and the answer was no, that as soon as the trial was over and we stopped controlling the fluid and alternating back and forth between months, the medical ICU went back to a saline predominant unit. So I think these are these are the kinds of things where they, the differences are only apparent in large scale population level studies like this. So uh, once we found the results and found that balanced crystalloid was better for our patients, the same mechanisms that we used to conduct the trial, so stocking balanced crystalloid in the units and using an advisor in the electronic health record to push people towards ordering balanced crystalloids, we turned those back on so that instead of using it to conduct a trial and alternating every month, now every patient's pushed towards balanced crystalloids. And because of that, we've seen improved outcomes in our patients. Yeah. Well, that's really great. It's always good to hear, you know, both, uh, you know, complicated studies like this that, that are hard to do, that you were able to do successfully with, like you said, 29,000 patients, um, you know, finding some interesting subgroup analyses. And also, again, the systems level uh, changes to make the differences. Again, uh, you know, in D, it's now pretty easy to do LR instead of saline if I want to. Um, but without that, I think, you know, be, I, I would probably still have been pretty skeptical, uh, in, you know, obviously until now. <laughs> so great. Well, thank you both for joining today and thanks for doing this, this great study. Um, appreciate it all. If you want to read the study, of course, you can get it at jamanetworkopen.com where everything is open access. We've got new papers coming out every, uh, every weekday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. And join us next week, Tuesday the 24th, before Thanksgiving, for another episode of JNO Live. So, of course, take care and stay safe. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks for having us.